guys can have a seat. Amen. Good singing. It is, isn't it so fun and enjoyable to sing those Christmas hymns? And I, I think as you, you love to hear the tune and it's reminiscent of Christmas, but then when uh, you, the words kind of hit you, and I think as you get older, not that I'm admitting to getting older, but um, like I'd never thought about it. a couple of songs ago about how one of the verse was about asking for quarrels and fights to cease, and I was like, oh wow, that's like right in our message today, um, and uh, very extremely fitting. So we're going through the book of James, and today we are in chapter four. Last week we had looked at um, the the bulk of this chapter, and today we'll be looking at the kind of third phase of the thought that James was introducing to us last week. James chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12. Kids can be dismissed to Children's Church if they'd like, and uh, uh, you're welcome to head down that way. So our plan this morning is to take a look at this text, these two verses, which, depending on different um, commentators, will put this section, these verses as a separate section. Others will stick it with the, um, the whole thought from verses 1 through 12. And you can see in various um, English translations and even how they're put apart. Remember the chapter and book divisions and even those uh, sections are not what's inspired to it, but you can even see differently how they're set apart, maybe in brackets, or if your Bible does it in paragraph form, or verse by verse, whichever way that would be. You can see that there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at these two verses, kind of zoom out um, at the whole thought, and then come then zoom back in at, at it. Uh, so James 4, verses 11 and 12 will be our text for this morning. Let's read the text and ask God to help us. Let's focus upon it. This is what God says. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Our Father, we need your help. Lord, this is, a, uh, th- this is, this is really like a, a sniper's bullet here to our soul. Uh, this, these two verses, Lord. This is you taking the sword of the Spirit that pierces to our soul. Lord, this affects all of us. All of us have sinned and broken what this text is trying to tell us to do and not do. Lord, so we need your help now. We need your spirit to take your word and take the spirit's sword and apply it. You tell us that, that these things are spiritual and the natural man can't discern the things of the spirit of God because they're spiritual. So Lord, we need your help to discern this. We need your help to apply this. Lord, so, Lord, help me get it out of the way and just let this text speak. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the context, James was talking about problems in this Christian community and how it had affected this and, and that there's, it's going to be there. And so he's talking about, uh, overall in the book of James, he's talking about the importance of this spiritual wholeness or this um, wholehearted, he keeps talking about being two-souled or double-minded, a double-minded man, and to be doers and not hearers only, and really to be kind of all in, not just straddle the fence, don't just be nominal, but really let your whole life be committed in this act of allegiance to Jesus Christ. And, and that's, in a sense, what we're doing when we take the Lord's table. We're saying, I'm remembering what you've done for me, Jesus, and I'm committing my allegiance to you, and I'm pledging that to you. And so he's applying that wholeheartedness of God, that commitment that I am fully surrendered to Christ, to this community dimension in the area of our speech. 
And he had already talked about this theme of being a peacemaker back in chapter 3 at the end about those who harvest of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. And so remember, he's talking to these Christians who are scattered, they're persecuted, um, the, those, uh, they, they've faced poverty. We've seen that in chapters 1 and 2. And those things, um, they didn't, they, they kind of exacerbated, but maybe didn't cause, that also comes about conflicts in the church. And so, in this community strife, this context of living faith, um, James talks about the importance of taming the tongue, and he's getting to the heart of that tongue issue. And we saw in uh, last week, we saw in this the roots and remedy of conflict, we saw the, the, the reality and the origin or the cause of this conflict in the first couple verses. And then we saw the scope of it, how he, it, he denounces it as this worldly conflict, this worldly quarrels that come about them. And then he, he gives the remedy in verses 6 to 10 in this picture of what um, repentance look like, looks like. But then when he comes to verses 11 and 12, he gives this particular manifestation of what conflict looks like in the community, and it looks like slanderous and critical speech. Now, conflict is something that should be kind of expected in just the human life, in your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, and even in our church, and if we, as we said last week, it exaggerate that, and it between humans and it becomes this is where wars come from and we went in a little bit of that last week as well but the fact that this is even here by way of review that that humans whenever we get together there it is eventually going to be conflict and in a sense they the early church had these problems too paul and Bar barnabas is an example peter and paul when writing in galatians philip and Udi Udia. The church in Corinth, the church in Galatia, Paul says that you're biting and devouring one another. Here in James, the class warfare between the rich and the poor. When we get to chapter 5, um, probably in the early part of the spring, January, February, that uh, we'll see the, um, the, cor the um, employment battles, but a kind of a modern-day labor idea, personal wars, and this is this disruption of the unity and harmony within the body and the Christian community is, is a target of Satan. And so these verses, James condemns this sin of slander, of false judgment. That, and then as we get to the end of this, he talks about overconfident business plans um, that is indifferent to the will of God. But these two verses particularly that we want to focus on today give us a strong argument about the sinfulness of critical speech. In fact, these are the two strongest and probably most important verses in the entire Scripture on the sin of slander. And so we all fit into this because all of us have interpersonal problems in family, marriage, church, workplace. James, what James has told us already is that a person's basic problem is not what others have done to us or the environment in which we've been raised or the circumstances in life that he's put us in, but our basic problem comes out of our own sinful heart. And so we need this spiritual wholeness. We need this wholehearted following of Jesus. And so he gives this particular example of conflict in the community in which the church, the Christian people, he calls them brethren— he just called them adulterous, but calls them brethren, is an area in which the church flirts with worldliness that is incompatible with the jealous desires that God has for his people to have wholehearted allegiance. Let me say that again. This is an area in which God's people, God's bride, flirts with worldliness that's incompatible with the jealous desire God has for a wholehearted allegiance to himself. And it is in the area of slander. Now, some of you, that might sound odd. You're like, whoa, you just said worldliness. I thought that was people that dress this way and listen to that type of music and drive this type of vehicle or wear those type of clothes. No, that might be. 
But worldliness is, needs to be defined by the Bible. Worldliness is inside of us and outside of us. And there are several things in James that he said, this is worldly. And slander in this critical speech is worldly. And so there is a deadly member in this room that could kill this place. It is the tongue inside each of us. Maybe you remember as a kid, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt me. That is the stupidest saying that you could ever say. Because some of you can still remember things kids said to you on the playground when you were a kid. They have hurt you. There are people that are paranoid their whole life because of something said, someone said to them, uh, maybe by a teacher or a friend or a coach or an offhand comment about how they look, what their nose looks like, whether they can sing or not, whether they're good at a sport or not, how, whether they look thin or fat or pretty or ugly or smart or dumb or whatever. And, and, there's, and, there, and some people that really hurts and, and hurts them. Other people, it just makes them bitter and want to like prove otherwise, right? And, and so th there, there's a lot of that that happens because of this. So he addresses this to Christians and he gives these two important verses on the subject of slander. Now you might say, well, why would James bring up slander at this point in this uh, talking about peace and heart within the people of God? Well, I believe it's because that it is natural whenever there is conflict and problems between brothers and sisters, there is a tendency for us to talk negatively about them behind their backs. Isn't that the case? I mean, you remember this in grade school. You have a little spat on the playground. You go back in, and in the line to the bathroom, one girl says to the other girl, well, she said this, and he pulled my hair, and da-da-da-da, you know? They talk negatively. They're mean, or whatever it might be. It is a tendency when there is conflict to talk negatively about someone behind their back. You can apply that to marriage. Get with your girlfriends, get with your buddies. Oh, my word, she is driving me nuts. Guess what he did again? I have, This is the... 17th time this week and it's only Monday I am so you know in the workplace in the church and, and some secular counseling ideas and even some little c Christian therapy models even encourage this type of sin of slander Am I labeling it like healthy ventilation or encouraging to talk about others when they're not present or things like this? Um, and in, in, in a following a worldly model instead of a biblical model of counseling, some will even Christianize this in the church and use this sin of slander and say, well, you know, we're just going to have a little secret of gathering where we can all express our concerns and pray for that one or that other. Um, and we do that in relation to conflict. Often judgmental attitudes and hurtful words are used. So what James does for us here is he gives us a negative, a phrase that we see repeated often in the New Testament. We actually early on, I think it was um, one of the first little small series I did when I got here, we went through a series on the one another's. And there's positive one another's, there's the, the, the grouped in ideas of love and caring for one another. This is one of the negative one another's when he says, do not speak evil against, and there's the word, the phrase, one another. So he gives these one another's. This is this radical idea throughout the entire New Testament. The one another's of the New Testament. The phrase one another um, is, the, is used probably a hundred times in the New Testament. One another, each for the other, are mutually reciprocally. Fifty-nine of those are specific commands teaching us how to relate to one another. And this is one of them. The one another's is the basis of this Christian community. It's something that often we overlook, that we think in terms of programs and structure and organization, but when the Bible looks at it, it looks in terms of health and the organic relationship. And so as one, uh, one uh, modern preacher said, that the primary activity of the early church was one anothering one another. Uh, it's when, you, when you look in the early church and you read the book of Acts, when you read the epistles, you don't see all these programs. What's their program? One another um, is, is this program. So he does this. He says, to these one another, 
don't speak against. So this spiritual wholeness has a community dimension that involves our speech. Your commitment to Jesus involves your commitment to your speech. Do not, it's the negative, the command, do not speak against one another. Speak against means to slander or to speak evil of. Um, one lexicon gives this broad and encompassing definition, definition of a defamation or slander. Other kinds of speech attacking a person or harmful to their reputation. We use words like slander or gossip to do that. So and what's the difference between slander and gossip? Well, slander means to speak against. It means to speak against someone truthfully or to speak falsely. Slander is a false statement that would damage someone's reputation. Slander is to create and spread false stories. The Old Testament used the idea of to bear false witness, that you took something that was false and you bore it and you passed it along. And you might say, well, I'm just saying what I heard. But it's bearing false witness, carrying it around. Gossip, on the other hand, is idle talk that may or may not be true. Sometimes someone will say, well, they're not gossiping. They're just kind of sharing or keeping up with things. Or gossip is sharing information that really shouldn't be shared. It's to take a true story where it doesn't need to go. To take true charges to the wrong court. The Bible uses the term for gossip called a whisperer. Tail-bearing, slander. These words in the Old Testament imply secrecy. In Proverbs, the whisperer, the giving evil report, or giving out, or carrying of slander. We see that in Proverbs, the use of the tongue. In, in the Psalms, defaming, um, tail-bearing, whether false, foolish, malicious. It shouldn't be done. The noun, slander, a crime of making a false spoken statement damaging someone's reputation. It's where we get the, 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 the middle English word that where we get scandal. Uh, someone always looking for the scandal. I call them drama mamas, you know. Always looking for the drama. What's the next thing? A mischief maker on Psalm 101. Someone making mischief has an interest in not not anything good, always looking for something there. You know, you can kind of get addicted to always having a problem and always having to have a fight going on, right? Uh, there's always looking for that, and it's like a drug. Webster's gives, gives some other definitions here, this slandering idea, the utterance of false charges and misrepresentation, defame or defamation or a false defamatory oral statement about someone. Slander. So I would say, beware of those who say things to you about others, because they will be saying things to others about you. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, it, wh so why is it wrong? Well, James goes on to tell us, stop speaking evil against one another, brothers, because, and he says, the one who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. You're actually breaking the law yourself. Critical speech is presumptuous violation of the law. You're presuming things. God has told us we're to love our neighbor. In fact, he, when he says the law, going back to Leviticus, 6, Leviticus 19, it, it tell, told us there to, not, to show love for neighbor. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And he also, later on, he specifically said in Leviticus 19, verse 6, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. So this law, we're saying, hey, well, I'm presuming that I'm not, I'm literally above that law. Um, the, 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 the Old Testament gives several others. It says in Psalm 50, verse 20, when you sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Psalm 101, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him will I destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him will not in, I, I will not endure. Proverbs 18, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down on the inmost body. 
Proverbs eleven thirteen: a talebearer re- reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Proverbs 20, verse 3, it's an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. 1 Peter 2, verse 1, so put away from all you all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. When you speak evil, you make yourself a judge in doing your defaming and disregarding God's law against slander yourself. When you slander someone, you're actually breaking the law that you're claiming that you're upholding. So you might think that gossip and slander are some kind of misdemeanor in God's sight, don't we? We kind of think, of well, those are the the little ones, you know, the the bad ones are, you know, the, the big things, right? Well, let's go to where we see we're in Romans 1. Go with me to Romans 1. Romans 1, verses 28 to the end of the chapter. It says that since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased or reprobate mind to do not what ought not to be done. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. No, it's not talking about the government. It's talking about what's in all of our hearts, right? And then look at the next sentence. They are gossips. Full of and they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteousness and decree that are not practice such things, deserve to die. That not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I mean, so look at this. I mean, think about this. In the midst of evil, murder, ruthlessness, hating God. It lists things like slander and gossip and disobedience to parents. The Old Old Testament and other passages spoke of slander as sin. James takes it a step farther. He suggests that we're sinning, but we're criticism of our fellow brother involves standing in judging over that believer. And God's not going to let us get away with thumbing our noses at him and his law. He is a holy, righteous, jealous God. Because then, the next, the next point is that we are making ourselves a judge. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. You're making yourself a judge. When we speak evil and criticize one another, not only are we ignoring the law, we're thinking we're superior to it. So how is... Criticizing another Christian, criticizing the law, James assumes that criticism of a fellow believer contradicts the demand that we love our neighbors. However high our orthodox view of God and our theology might be exactly right in our doctrine of God and the theology proper, a failure to actually do what God says is in fact to put in store, Ray Ortland said it this way, our relationships with one another reveal to us what we really believe as opposed to what we think we believe. Our convictions as opposed to our opinions. We can say we believe the Bible. We can put notes online. We can quote it and we can say, I stand on the, you know, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone in the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E, you know, and we'll shout, right? But if you slander your brother, your brothers and sisters, saying you're putting yourself above it. (laughs) You're putting yourself in, you're also putting yourself in God's place. That's great. (laughs) I was trying to think of a witty way to transition that, but I couldn't. Don't worry, it's happened to me too. Don't worry. So we're making ourselves a judge, and we're, then, then he comes to the, end, the next verse, and he's basically saying we're putting ourselves in God's place. So he says there, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? So why is criticizing people so wrong? Second, it infringes upon the unique right that God himself has to be 
the lawgiver and judge. By refusing to submit to the law, slanderers put themselves above the law, and God is the ultimate judge of the world. And so Isaiah 3, verse 22, it says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. He said, he, so I love how James really hit that. He's, you could tell James is drawing from so much Old Testament Bible. Um, the Lord is our lawgiver. He is our king. He's able to save and to destroy. You get that about God? He's able to save and to destroy. God alone has the authority to save those who repent and the power to destroy those who refuse to repent. This is something that God alone reserves for himself. And so... Um, Jesus said to don't fear those that are able to kill to, to destroy the body but fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell do not fear those that kill the body they can't kill the soul rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul so this prohibition of criticism this is this slander taking it where it doesn't need to be is not um the proper love-driven, necessary, truth-giving responsibility that we all have to speak and confront or deal with an unrepentant sinner or sin in our own lives, uh, to go to someone and say, hey, as my pastor said growing up, when your, your real friends will tell you when you have a booger on your nose, right? You, they're going to say, hey, you were, you were kind of harsh with him, you know? Hey, you, that... You, you know, or dealing with that. This is not speaking about. This is a talking about that taking it where it doesn't need to be. So, at the heart of gossip and slander is a bitter, selfish spirit that James is dealing with. He's already talked about this selfish ambition in our tongue in chapter three. He's talked about how this this selfish desires that weren't fulfilled in the beginning of chapter four. How we wanted something and didn't get it. This is driving it. These quarrels and disputes come out of it so what's it's coming out of that type of heart so why do we do it why do we gossip why do we slander well maybe we do it to tear others down to make ourselves feel better kind of push ourselves push others down makes us feel like we're coming up conflict with others can also be a distraction for our own soul like i said you, you kind of get addicted to it and God might be revealing something in our own soul, but it's easy to always be distracted on the, the current fight of the day or the current conflict that's going on, whether that be in the family or online or um, in, in, in your church or in your marriage. There's something going on, but there's always the next argument and something to talk about in your job situation. We can get to where we're always looking for that conflict because it kind of is a smokescreen for what's going on in our own soul. Sometimes we gossip just to justify our own position. You know, if I can say something bad about per that person, it justifies where I'm at. But James has already told us it's this selfishness and this pride in our heart that causes this. So because that pride would lead us to gossip and slander, some of that pride that would lead us to gossip and slander was to, would be to maybe make ourselves the, the source of information. You know, the code words for conflict is people are saying. And they come to me. I don't know why they come to me. They don't come to others or the people that are actually involved with it, but they come to me. So therefore, you all need to come to me and listen to me as the source of all knowledge because I know right there this happens it can be a source of our pride we want to have the distinction of being the first one to share the latest news with our group of friends you can you can see this literally before your eyes as soon as you open up that whatever social media app is closest to you and that someone wants to oh the first one to share something that happened to somebody else um that to, to share that and it happens in interpersonal what happened to so-and-so? You hear what's going on over there? Did you brought, oh, oh, you hear, they're splitting up. Did you hear? You know, um, this happens. It is arrogant. Both gossip and slander deny a humility. Jesus said, 
to judge right judgment. To, he said to consider the log in your own eye before you start looking at specks in other people. Um, this is the attitude of someone that, you know, I'm, I'm going and listening to a sermon for somebody else, you know. I'm listening to this so that I can apply it to somebody else. Or going to a couples conference by yourself so that you can go back and tell your spouse what they ought to be doing right. Pro tip, that does not work. It is arrogant. It's not loving, it's selfish. Defaming our brothers and sisters involves others' sin too. Slanderers do not love. They're not humble. Slanderers appoint themselves in a position of superiority. Basically, they're saying, I don't need to obey the laws that require love and that give all people um, roughly equal status before God. I get to be the judge. These type of arguments and disputes, when they are conducted with unrestrained tongues, even cursing, James says in chapter 3, denouncing each other, we see here, is wrong and it's worldly all of these are manifestation of a worldly spirit and we must replace worldliness the wisdom of this world with the wisdom that is from above this flirting with the world is incompatible with God's jealous desire for a wholehearted allegiance to himself so we need to apply this we need to realize that our brothers and sisters are that. They're our brothers and sisters. And we need to know that God and God alone is the true judge and the one who saves. And that we are all in the gospel. That we are all sinners. And we, so th- this, this is going to make us kind of un- uncomfortable. James concludes these thoughts by telling us we're not to judge our neighbor. It's an interesting shift there. The word from brother to neighbor by the, by the time you get to of verse the end of verse 12 god is wanting this unity in the church he is in, in in among his people among brothers and sisters in families he is so jealous to protect this unity that the bible gives these strong commands and warnings against it i alluded to this before in proverbs 6 these 16 six things that the lord hate yea seven are an abomination to the lord a proud look a lying tongue hands that shed innocent blood heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. When we think of the really bad things that God is against, we normally don't put that there. But the Bible does. The New Testament gives strong warning against those who cause divisions. Romans 16, 17 and 18, I urge you, brethren, Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. You speak, those are in the context of doctrinal things, but they're causing division and offenses contrary to this truth, this orthodoxy and orthopraxy that the church has been involved in. In Galatians, now the works of the flesh are evident. What's the flesh look like versus the spirit? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Jude warns us against those who would set up divisions amongst God's people. And so, when it comes to slander and gossip, do you participate in it? Do you promote it? Do you kind of get into that party spirit? The scriptures and the authority of the Bible and this text and others would tell us to run from that type of environment. Don't be part of it. To see that temptation in the same way you'd see temptation to other sin. See it the way Joseph would see in, the, in Potiphar's house when Potiphar's wife comes to him to seduce him. And he leaves his cloak and gets out of there. And repent. Maybe you've been waiting in this pool of this type of 
communication for so long you don't even know what it's like to not be in that type of drama that there's a strive to fight to keep that unity jesus is praying for this he is working towards this and so what's our solution well we go back he's already told us here he told us in chapter three that this tongue cannot be controlled Remember, Pastor George gave us that. There was the illustrations that were natural, the, the bit in the horse's mouth, the rudder on the ship, that these are things that naturally we can tame, that we can tame that in the creation world. But the tongue can't be tamed. I mean, think about that. We can, even today, we put aquariums or we put whales and dolphins and seals and they obey human commands we go to the circus and we can see horses and camels and lions and lions and tigers and bears oh my obey human commands we can go to a farm and see cows and horses and bulls and chickens and every other thing being controlled but the scripture says that we can't control the tongue Well, actually, it said, the text said, no man can tame the tongue. Augustine said it this way. He does not say that no one can tame the tongue, but that no one of men. So that when it is tamed, we confess that it is brought about by the pity, the help, and the grace of God. Mark said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The horse, for the horse to be controlled, the bit had to be put in the mouth by someone else. For the rudder on the ship, the ship's captain had to have it there and have control of it. And for the tongue to be controlled, the will of the human needs to be controlled, and the heart is what controls it. The heart moves the tongue. The heart wags the tongue. The tongue is the dipstick of the soul, right? It tells us what's there. And so what it tells us is that the heart needs to be changed. Well, how's the heart changed? Well, that's where the gospel comes in. He gives us a new heart. Well, how do we get that? Well, he told us in this attitude back in verse, look, up, look above in verse 6. He says, of all this jealousy and wrath that God would have against this, he gives more grace. The only thing greater than the jealousy and the wrath against sin that God has is his grace. And then he gives several of those commands. Resist draw near cleanse your hands purify your heart he's basically giving us this picture of what repentance look like change your inner disposition purify your hearts change your outward behavior cleanse your hands i mentioned this last week that this this internal and external this is what this repentance look like verse 9 he says to be wretched and mourn and weep this is very proper to be sorry and humble before god and then humble ourselves this heartfelt sorrow is this proper response and he changes us he gives us this new heart the only a renewed heart can produce renewed words this is why you can't just decide or pledge or do an exercise to help your tongue you need to have your heart changed and that's where Christ comes and he offers that to you if you're not saved he offers that for you for not just your tongue but for your whole soul and your whole eternity but for Christians here this is an aspect we need to apply the gospel and maybe before we even receive the Lord's table you need to confess this sin it might even be very appropriate and not weird at all for Christian brothers and sisters to get up in the quiet and go and talk to another brother or sister and confess and seek restoration before we receive the table together let's pray together heads bowed eyes closed In the quiet, I want to encourage you to do business with God. You might need to confess this. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh God, I've been a gossip. I confess to slander of my brother and sister, to my spouse, to my co workers. Please forgive me. Oh 
God, I've sown dissension in my church, in my workplace, in my marriage. Please forgive me. You might need to pray that right now. You might say, Jason, this is so much a part of me, I can't even think of living different. Maybe you need Jesus. Maybe you need Jesus in salvation. He, he's like, oh, Lord, I confess. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I confess my sin. I want to receive the gift of eternal life. Call out to God. He promises that whoever calls on him, he will save. So do that now. Father, thank you for this text. Apply it the way your, you, your spirit would want. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to invite Pastor George to come up and we're going to celebrate the Lord.